something I've been thinking a bit about recently is this whole notion of cancel culture that I've mentioned before. I did a video on this a little while ago, and it's kind of just the national conversation right now. Um, but I'm thinking about this just in terms of, of the church and as Christians, how do we deal with this question of cancel culture and how do we view this aspect of our culture and, and what's going on right now where um, the culture is seeking to apologize for for past things and uh, take care of them or make recompense for them in, in one way or another and exactly how it is that we should approach this question. Now, when I uh, made the video earlier, I received a number of, of comments uh, mentioning the fact, and, and I've seen this as a major theme, that you can't really speak about cancel culture as something just that liberalism does because within especially american fundamentalist christianity uh, there was a large emphasis on what was not allowed and things that should be thrown out altogether or canceled if you want to use that language though it certainly was not the the kind of language that was used in that in that particular um, community so as i've thought about this more uh, you know I, what i'm coming to is a realization of the fact that cancel culture is something that is kind of necessary in one way or another. There's really not any way to avoid the fact that there are boundaries. There are moral boundaries to any society and any culture. There have to be, and there have always been. There's no such thing as a, a perfectly open society that simply has no boundaries around it whatsoever. And we don't have to think of that just in terms of, of government coercion. Because one thing that I've seen in a lot of the, the responses to the claims of cancel culture, especially um, those on the left, is, well, the government isn't saying these things. It's this private business. So it's, you know, Amazon who has decided to stop selling uh, Ryan Anderson's his book on the transgender issues. And it's YouTube that has decided to deplatform these individuals. Those are private organizations, they're private companies, and so they can make whatever boundaries they they want to have uh, and i think that we we have seen this around what are the you know free speech platforms that have existed or you know come to prominence as alternatives to the the social media that certainly has a particular message that they don't want heard is that we see the the kind of extremes jump on those other platforms and take over to the point that even uh, companies like Parler have had to initiate some kind of censorship on some kind of material. I mean, there are certain things that most people universally agree should not be allowed on a public forum, even if it is owned by a private organization. And we could talk about, you know, lewd images and, and other things like that, especially certain kinds that are harmful to children and, and yeah, those, those type of issues. So I think we could pretty much agree there. My, my point in saying all of this is that we have to have boundaries and every society and culture has boundaries. We have moral boundaries. Uh, and that doesn't have to be due to government coercion, but it is often, or maybe even more often done uh, by way of, of just social pressure. Uh, it is has been true through a large portion of history that a lot of behaviors have been stopped because of the social shame that comes with it. The fact that it will have ramifications in your community, the fact that it will have ramifications for your marriage or your family. So to speak about ethical boundaries that are being built, we don't have to talk just in terms of government coercion. I think that's very much wrong headed. In fact, oftentimes it is the social stigma and social pressure, the losing your job, the not being able to have a platform anywhere on any of the major sites where you can, well, make a living, like selling your books on Amazon or having videos on YouTube that are that are monetized. Whatever other platforms there are simply do not have the reach of those platforms. So to be then kicked off of those platforms is to is a form of, of censorship. Then the question is, is censorship always wrong? And I would say no, it is not always wrong. And I would also say every culture has to have censorship. The question is simply what boundaries do we have? What guides those boundaries and what are they? So the more I've, I've really thought about this particular question of cancel culture and how especially the, the progressive left is dealing with these questions today, I think the only proper framework in which we can really understand what's going on is by grappling with the reality that progressivism is itself a religious ideology. We have embraced this myth of secularity within 
within the West. This idea that we can have this kind of religiously or morally neutral society and that there are these kind of fundamental basic moral truths that we can all agree on and our laws and our societies can reflect just some kind of general notions of, of morality and they will function well uh, from, from there. Now, uh, to a certain extent, those kinds of things did work for a time. And why they worked for a time is because society was still working and operating on what are essentially Christian or Judeo-Christian assumptions about goodness and about the world. And what we've seen is those ideas gradually fade away so that now it becomes more and more apparent that one religious system is essentially replacing another religious system. And this is really, I think, the, the proper context in which we have to look at radical progressivism. And I'm not speaking about everybody who's left-leaning. I'm speaking about the kind of radical left-wing activism that has taken over um, so many in, in our culture today. So, uh, and I've been critical of the far right as well, so nobody's getting out of my criticisms here. <laughs> so, um, but as you're, you know, you think about radical progressivism, it has its own system of sin, it has its own system of shame, it has its own system of guilt, it has its own system of salvation. And it also has its eschatology, it has its end hope, its end times, what it is striving for, what the goal of that system is. Now, these essential elements of religion are something that is simply imprinted upon the human soul. We can talk about the sensus divinitatis, as, as Calvin would say, this kind of sense of, of divinity or the sense of the divine that we all have within us. Um, if you look at the work of someone like, like Wolfhard Pannenberg, he speaks about this notion of the infinite or the inescapability of the question of God that is just inherent within um, the, the human heart or human society as a whole. There's no way to escape these kinds of questions. We have to face and we have to wrestle with these questions, the question of our finitude and the infinite in one way or another. So progress, progressivism hasn't escaped those questions. What it's doing is offering an alternative system to understand those questions. So if we think about the system of sin, sin is understood within the progressivist system as structures or systems of oppression. And then we have a system of redemption. Uh, we have redemption via whatever means, whether it's revolution, whether that means something political, or, or some kind of social ideology and the spread of that ideology, we have ways to kind of solve those, those dilemmas. And what we're seeing, I think, in, in cancel culture is the notion of excommunication that is outside of the church. And I think you, you especially see this, you know, I, I, there's some parallels, interesting parallels here between the way that, that the media operates today, the way that um, just these, these social media organizations operate today and the way that the medieval Roman Catholic popes acted. There was this immense power that the popes had in the medieval period over rulers, over kings, where they could, if they desired, have influence over what the king, what the person who was supposedly in political power would do by excommunicating that person. And we have, we have stories of this going on in the medieval period where we have kings that are you know, doing penance and essentially doing the will of the pope because there is this eternal punishment and shame that comes from the king not acting in accord with the will of the leaders of the church. This is kind of exactly what's going on. There is this social shame and excommunication that's happening with leaders in various spheres in the world, and they are essentially excommunicated until they do their penance. And their penance is their, their confession. They have this notion of a, of a confession of sins. You know, they're not using a language of sin. That's, that's what they're doing. It has to be public. And then they have to do some kind of penance, whether it's groveling in one form or another, or saying certain things, or apologizing for this, or apologizing for that, but then also taking X amount of time off, or going to sensitivity training, or whatever, uh, whatever it, it may be. I think the, the proper context, though, to understand this is to understand it within the context of, of religion uh, as a kind of penance, a secular penance that brings them back into the fold of the kingdom. It's not the kingdom of God, of course, at this point, it's the kingdom of, of progressivism. And there is, of course, the eschatological hope, uh, and this final eschatological hope uh, is for a society of, of tolerance. Now, of course, you know, you can define tolerance in, in various ways. Tolerance, certainly within the context of at least contemporary progressivism, does not mean we all just kind of leave each other alone. It means that we all accept 
who everyone is in their self-chosen identity. That is kind of the, the end goal. That is the eschatos, the, the telos of uh, the progressive ideology today. So just some things that, that I've been personally thinking about as a theologian and kind of thinking through our current cultural moment and how, how we are to think about it. And I think what this does in, in thinking about it in religious terms, it really helps us to understand the kind of passion that exists right now, uh, the rigor, the vehemence with which people fight for these things, uh, because what we are seeing in our culture is really a, a religious zealotry. Uh, it is a, a zealotry for what they, these individuals on, on the, the radical left, um, what they assume to be the ultimate good. And this is where we're left in our culture today is that we simply do not have agreement as to what the good is. Um, Alistair McIntyre deals uh, with this, this question after virtue. We, so we don't have agreement as to what, what the good is. And what happens is when society doesn't agree on what the good is, you can't have a constructive conversation. And this is what happens when you have essentially competing religious models that are governing how people are thinking. And you have various ideas of the good that are completely opposed to one another. So what the good is from, um, you know, from a Christian perspective is very different from what the good is from a kind of radical leftist perspective. Um, so we have, if we have different notions of what authority is, we have different notions of goodness, we have different notions of what morality even is, or if there is even a purpose to it at all, we simply won't be able to communicate with one another. And, and unfortunately, that's kind of the point where we're at. And we, we have really no way to communicate across the aisle at this point, because it, it appears that among many, there is simply such an ideological gap that, that we are unable to to bridge that gap because we're both speaking a completely completely different language and i think the best way to think of it is in some ways in terms of two different religious ideological systems so uh, these are my thoughts here i am not giving you any solutions these are just things that i that i think about uh and uh, so i'd like to hear your comments or thoughts on this below uh, thanks so much and we'll see you in the next video god bless